Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and today's episode is going to have spoilers from episode 6 of The Acolyte. Now, there's been a lot of theorizing lately that Kaimri, the Dark Master, the Stranger Danger, is somehow connected with Darth Plagueis and his master, Darth Tenebris. A lot of this is coming from people who are familiar with the legendary Darth Plagueis novel, which is honestly so well written and so interesting, and I think it really should be a part of the canon. One of the main reasons why people believe that Chimera is related to these two Sith is because they are the two rule of two Sith during this period. It should be noted that in Legends, based on Darth Plagueis' age, he's either unborn or he's just a young child still contemplating the death of his father. Now, because there's no canon date for Darth Plagueis' birth, they could just alter it to fit into the timeline of the Acolyte. Darth Plagueis was famously very secretive about his identity, and I'm sure he tried to obscure his actual birth date as well. The only information in canon that we have on Darth Plagueis is that he died right around the time that Palpatine ascended to the Chancellorship. That's also when he murdered him. But given the time frame of the Acolyte, it's far more likely that Tenebrous is the resident Sith. There isn't really that much information uh, about him in canon. In Legends, we know he's a Bith who designed starships as a cover. A telltale sign that Chimere is an apprentice of his would be him flying a state-of-the-art vessel. This Bith Sith Lord was not only an engineer, but he was also filthy rich. It was under him that Darth Plagueis would start building up his financial power. Another thing that people point out is that um, during Darth Tenebrous' death in Legends, uh, he was actually with Plagueis, and they were basically examining a Cortosis mine they had bought. This is one of the many assets that the Sith were trying to acquire, not only for its monetary value, but obviously because Cortosis is very useful against the lightsabers. Um, there would be a terrorist attack during this time, Tenebris would get hurt, and instead of saving him, Plagueis would kill his master, as the rule of, uh, as the rule of two Sith often did. In Legends, this would have happened around 67 BBY. The Acolyte actually takes place much earlier, around 132 BBY. Now, because Chimera uses Cortosis, and also the island he's on sort of matches the description of where the Cortosis mine was located on the world of Baldemic, people believe that this is further proof that Chimera is somehow related to the Sith Bith. I love saying that. Now, others have stated that maybe he is Darth Venomous. Darth Venomous was a second apprentice trained by Darth Tenebris. Like a lot of rule of two Sith, uh, Tenebris noticed his apprentice Darth Plagueis getting more powerful, and he suddenly didn't really want to die at the hands of his apprentice, and so he got a second apprentice, another Bith known as Darth Venomous. Darth Venomous would be defeated by Darth Plagueis, and he would actually experience a very gruesome death multiple times on the operating table in Darth Plagueis' secret lab. You see, it was on Darth Venomous that Darth Plagueis would test his um, new power of bringing life back to a dead body by literally forcing the midichlorians to stay inside of the deceased body. He would basically uh, kill Darth Venomous multiple times and then bring him back to life until the Bith's organs failed. It's it's really gruesome. Now, here's the thing. There might be portions of this theory that are true. Maybe this is that Cortosis mine where Chimera is. Maybe somehow Chimera is even related to the Sith. Although, when he mentions the power of two, that is kind of different from the rule of two. But I definitely don't think he's Darth Venomous. Not only is he not the right age, he's also not a Bith. And also, Venomous was kind of a side character who was not even that important in the Darth Plagueis novel. But I think the people who made up this theory is just looking at the Legends timeline and matching it up with the Acolytes. Um, I don't think they're actually looking into what the Acolyte show actually stands for and what they're trying to do with the show. Because once you understand what the Acolyte is about, then it's very clear who Chimere's former master is. The Acolyte is set in the High Republic period at the very end of it. It's apparent from the very first scene where we see Yord walk onto that Trade Federation ship and basically have his way with that Nimodian's mind that this show is designed to show the flaws of the Jedi Order. They have become an all-powerful institution completely unchecked. And every member of the Jedi we've seen so far, Master Sol to Master Indara to Master Torben, Kanaka, even Jeki and Yord, to a certain degree, are flawed. But these individuals aren't necessarily representative of the wider Jedi Order. Master Soul and his strike team report directly to Jedi Master Vernestra Rowe, who perhaps is the Jedi I worry about the most. Vernestra Rowe is concerned about this assassin targeting the Brendock floor, but apparently she's even more worried about the wider Jedi Order and the High Council and the Senate finding out about the situation. Now, she does have individuals like Senator Rancor breathing down her neck, 
trying to basically destroy the Jedi Order's image. He wants to commission a third party audit of the Jedi Order's action uh, and, you know, hopefully bring them to heel, which in my opinion is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, if the Jedi have nothing to hide, they should have nothing to fear as well. And if there are issues with the Jedi Order, then a well-intentioned third party consultancy could help moderate the Jedi's power. I mean, one of the biggest problems that any police force has is not just internal corruption or lack of training, but just the sheer amount of things that they are expected to do. In many cities in the United States, especially during economic turmoil where budgets seem to drop, the police are usually the last ones still being funded. This means they have to not only provide security, but also other services that other branches of the local government used to handle. They have to take care of traffic violations, do social service calls, mental health care calls, things that honestly most police departments don't have the resources or training to handle. Handle. On the flip side, the police are specifically equipped to deal with threats of a certain nature. Bringing a gun or just their presence alone can quickly escalate certain situations because, honestly, many Americans fear the image of the police. I can imagine the Jedi might also develop a similar image problem. Um, you can tell that a lot of criminal elements really hate the Jedi because of their role in the galaxy. And so, if I were the High Council, I would welcome a third-party audit it could really decrease the workload that the Jedi have to deal with and allow them to focus on their core mission, which is Force-related issues, and deterring the resurgence of the Sith. But it seems like Vanessa Rowe, who isn't a Grandmaster, who might not even be uh, one of the members of the High Council, is trying to single-handedly cover up what is a very dangerous situation. And after the skirmish on Kofar, there's now 10 dead Jedi bodies, she'll have to explain. I mean, up until now, she's managed to keep things under wraps, but 10 dead Jedi? I feel like during the High Republic era, that is something people will notice. Vanessa Rowe's attempt to cover up everything that's happening in the Acolytes, I think is going to end up as a failure. Maybe Kia Mundi, who actually proposed going to the council earlier with information, will be the one to whistleblow. The fact that later on in episode one, Kia Mundi claims that there are no Sith in the galaxy seems to indicate that Chimer is not a Sith, or at least he doesn't find out about him. So who is Chimer's master, or at least the former master in this case? I think it definitely is someone in the Jedi Order. He knows way too much about the Jedi. He connects with Osha in a way that seems to indicate that he has real empathy for a situation because he's gone through something quite similar. Now, if we take a look at Chimer's character, I would argue that while he utilizes the dark side, while he gets angry um, and hateful, most of the time he just seems kind of sad. He seems like an isolated individual who's dejected and broken. He's not really consumed by his emotions either. He doesn't worship the dark side like a Sith does. And his movements, his demeanor, are like that of a wounded animal that has been discarded away. And he even says the Master Soul that the Jedi might consider him a Sith, but that doesn't necessarily mean he actually is one. And then there's this line at the end of episode five, when he finds Osha. Even in the revelation of our triumph, you see the depth of our despair. Now this is actually a very interesting and also controversial line. I think a lot of people probably missed this because they're actually quoting Jordan Peterson here, a very controversial figure. Even in the revelation of their triumph, the initial depth of their despair. Jordan Peterson is an intellectual who is very polarizing. Um, and that's because he was a big voice, especially like five or six years ago. I used to actually listen to him. I felt like he had a lot of interesting and intelligent things to say. Um, in recent years, he's kind of disappeared. He's fallen off. I had to do more research about him before we actually do a video covering this specific issue. We also have to wait for the end of the Acolytes because this is one of the most political statements that the show is making that isn't related to Star Wars specifically. This is really reaching to the outer world because basically they're relating Jordan Peterson to the main villain of this story by quoting him. We kind of have to wait until the Acolyte is over um, to see who Chimera actually is before analyzing uh, whether the Acolyte is trying to be empathetic towards Jordan Peterson or paint him as some evil villain. I kind of have a, I kind of have a feeling I know what which direction they're going to go for here, but. Uh, uh, you know, let's see. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to take this quote at face value. It means that Chimer has remorse. That even though he's finally gotten what he's wanted, a potential apprentice in Osha, the death of several Jedi, which most likely will lead to an investigation of what Vernestor Rowe is up to, and probably will also lead to the uncovering of the Jedi's actions on Brendok. This could actually kill the Jedi, and that's what Chimer has wanted this entire time. And despite being so close to his triumph, he thinks about the depths of his despair. I think that means he wasn't lying about being a former Jedi. 
It also means that in some ways he probably still wishes that whatever happened to him had never occurred, and that in some twisted way he pities his own situation. I think like a lot of Dark Jedi, Kymer still thinks about his past life and yearns for it. I think it's for this reason he's able to attract Osha. He shows her a bit of his humanity, empathy. He understands her trauma, and the fact that she's lost everything makes them, in many ways, kindred spirits, because they have both been rejected by the Jedi Order. And so, who is his master? Well, a lot of you guys already know. There are a few clues. One is this, the scar on his back. This is no simple lightsaber thrust. It's not even a lightsaber slash. It's something far more violent and branches out in many directions. It looks like this injury was caused by a lightsaber whip. And the only Jedi we know that has one of these is Vernesta Rupp. Furthermore, Chimera also has this line, which reveals that he's a lot older than he looks. You speak as if you were a Jedi. I was. A long time ago. I've never heard of you. It was a really long time ago. Vernesta Rowe is about 116 by the time the Acolyte starts, and we know a lot about her, like, first few years as a Jedi, but that all ends when the Star light beacon is destroyed in 232 BBY. Vernessa Rowe, as a prodigy in the Force, was a Jedi Knight at the time as a 16-year-old. After the events of the Starlight Beacon's destruction, she kind of withdraws from the Order and becomes a Wayseeker. This is sort of like an alternative to the Barish Vow that Master Torben took after the Brendog incident. A Wayseeker remains to be a Jedi, but they remove themselves from the influences of the High Council. They're basically an independent Jedi. Oftentimes, individuals who take this path isolate themselves and focus on meditating and communing with the Force, which Vanessa Rowe apparently does. The truth is, even though her skills were immense in the Force, she was probably too immature to really handle the situation that was thrown at her. The war against the Nile was devastating. She lost many friends, saw many innocent Republic citizens and military personnel perish. She saw many Jedi go mad, filled with rage, and turn to the dark side. She saw the galaxy turn against the Jedi after they were unable to protect it from the Nile threat. This shaped her view on the galaxy, on the role of the Jedi Order, on just how dangerous the political order was, and it damaged her in ways that I don't think she even understood at the time. What's even more interesting is her relationship with a Jedi who was two years younger than her, the Genetian human being known as Imrus Kantaros. Like all Genetians, Kantaros was an empath and was extremely sensitive to the emotions of people around him. He could also alter and change other people's emotions. This made him quite a volatile Jedi. After a Jedi Master was killed by the Nile, Kantaros basically loses his cool on a mission and almost falls to the dark side. Vanessa Rowe is there at the time and tries to stop him, and he threatens to kill her if she gets in his way. And so Vanessa Rowe would actually detain Kantaros using her lightsaber whip, and she would also destroy his lightsaber. The funny thing is, after this event, Emers Kantaros apologizes and is full of remorse and is accepted by Vernesta Rowe as her Padawan. The two would travel together and go on many missions, and Emers Kantaros was presumed to be dead, along with many other Jedi after the destruction of the Starlight Beacon. But it was found out later on that he survived and was trapped in Nile's space, and Vernesta Rowe would basically go in after him to try to find him. Vanessa Rowe was ultimately an okay master to Kantaros. There was really hardly any time for her to train him with the constant conflict against the Nile. But there's a hundred year gap in between the Starlight Beacon's destruction and the Acolyte, so anything could have happened to her. We know that eventually Rowe would stop being a Wayseeker and return back to the Jedi Fold, but it's clear that she still remains suspicious of the High Jedi Council, and she's still acting kind of like a rogue here. I actually think her whole sketchy cover-up of the incident on Brendog is not just related to the Jedi's political enemies, I believe that she's somehow personally responsible, or knows that she's personally responsible for the assassinations of the Brendock Four. But Master, I'm sure that these casualties are due to the planet's uncharted environment. You don't I need to handle this personally. I hope that is all right with you. Vanessa Rowe also lets this slip when her secret group is analyzing the footage of May and trying to figure out if she's, you know, being trained by a splinter group of force users, a you know, dark Jedi, the Sith. She turns up all these years later trained by one of our own. You think a Jedi taught her? Even a hologram can tell me that. Is it really obvious, Vanessa Rowe, or perhaps she knows about Chimer, that she suspects that he's still out there somewhere. Her former Padawan, or perhaps even an illegal apprentice she took on during her time as a Wii Seeker. I mean, the whole fact that she disappears for an entire century uh, from the lore, you know, ma makes her very sketchy to me. Perhaps she's even trained herself to become a dark side force user and has infiltrated the Order now. I mean, Chimer kind of acts like a Boca Jedi in a lot of ways, like a Sage Ventress or 
Ezra Bridger. There's a certain vibe of Jedi who are trained away from the temple. That would explain his sloppy combat form. That would explain why no one's heard of him. Although Master Soul in that one duel says he senses something familiar about Chimer. Although he could just be referencing the previous encounter he had with him in the apothecary shop. So what about Chimer's age then? Um, how could he have been a part of the Jedi Order so long ago if he looks about the same age as, I don't know, Yord? Well, I believe that that gruesome injury he has left them in a stasis pod, a back to tank, where his wound could heal slowly. And he wouldn't be the first High Republic era Jedi to do something like this. There's the tale of Dagan Gera from Jedi Survivor. He wakes up during the Imperial era and meets Cal Kestis. So, you know, Chimir being stuck in a stasis pod for half a century is not that far fetched. Although I don't have concrete proof that this is really what's going on, I think this is really the only theory that makes sense. Because I believe that Chimera is 90% honest to Osha when he's talking about his past. He's telling the truth about being a former Jedi. He's remorseful and sad because it was never his choice to lead the Jedi. He was probably kicked out because of his former trauma. And I believe that he is old and was a Jedi a long, long time ago. It only makes sense that Vanessa Rowe is somehow connected to Chimera to the incident on Brendok. Because why else build her up into a villain? Everything is pointing towards this direction. There's more at stake than just simple politics. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think about my theory. Uh, and also, don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.